What does it mean to be described as the most haunted house in England? That is the reputation that Shingle Hall has acquired. How did it come about? How does such a reputation distort and colour the events that go on here? Shingle Hall in West Lancashire is a place with a long and murky history. It goes back to the beginning of the 13th century. People lived and worked in a moated farmhouse here when the Knights of Europe were marching off to the Crusades. Later on, during the Reformation, this place was a sanctuary for Roman Catholics in the area. The place is full of tunnels and crannies in which Catholic priests used to hide. People risked their lives to come and practice the rituals of the Mass here. Jingle Hall was a secret mass centre at the time of the religious persecution and we have priest hides because they came and practised mass. And when mass was about to be said, a candle was lit in the mass window, in the porch, and the flame would go across and light up the mass window on the outer wall. So the local people knew that if there was a candle shining in the mass window, mass was about to be said at Jingle Hall and it was safe to come. Now, if the authorities came and found that people were practising mass here, they would be taken away and killed. It wasn't a case of don't let it happen again, they were taken away and killed. In modern times, Shingle Hall has always had a ghostly reputation. It's the local haunted house. Although for people brought up in the village, that has always been treated as something of a joke. We never actually saw any ghosts. But we always, always because it was storm lanterns and candles, and an old um, coal fire and wood fire, so it was always dark and flickery inside. But it was tradition that all the youngsters had to go out of the back door, uh, the rear door in the lounge, and the stairs sort of go upwards along a landing and then past what was reputed to be the haunted room. Stamp on the floor at the end and it used to take us, oh, it seemed like ten minutes, probably two minutes to get to the end, but only two seconds to get downstairs after we banged on the floor. But despite that, many people who've had cause to visit the place for one reason or another describe strange experiences they've had here that, to say the least, are difficult to explain away. John Green, for example, came here simply to install some central heating he will never forget the experience. After three, two, probably two to three days, I thought maybe I was getting a little bit behind, I'll ask another engineer to come with me. I brought him over on the Wednesday morning, took him through the job and said, does this radiator to finish the tank in the loft, etc., etc." We came to this fireplace, which was already finished, the pipe work was in, all this here was in and in position. It just needed the, the actual boiler to be connected. As I turned to say this, I looked round and to my amazement, there was nothing there. This lot had gone. I went over to see Mrs Kirkham, who was upstairs, and said, Judy, we come down, somebody's taking my pipe work out or whatever. As we came back into the room, everything was back as it was before. I don't really know um, what ghosts may be. All I can say is that I have had an experience here, and it has changed my thoughts of belief on, on the supernatural, or whatever you may call it. Terry Whittaker is a radio producer who decided to spend the night at Shingle Hall and do some recordings. Again, he will never forget it. At about 20 to 1 in the morning, uh, we heard footsteps out here in the corridor. And two of us came out to, to see if there was anybody out here. I, w I was stood there, and the other, the other chap was stood there. And in all, all floorboards, when anybody walks on them, they spring. And these are actually springing. And we watched them, uh, watched as, as this invisible entity walked across. And then we looked over here, and, and standing just here, with his arms tucked in his sleeves, and his cowl up was a monk. We couldn't see his face for the cowl. We could see him standing here. It was as solid looking as you or I. And after about 30 seconds, he just drifted rather than walked forward through a huge cupboard that was here uh, and straight into the wall, which afterwards we realised was the entrance to the priest's hide, the original entrance to the priest's hide. The strange thing about it was we'd been following these ghosts, chasing ghosts for 12 weeks for the series and we not come across anything. And then suddenly on this particular night, there we are, on our last programme, faced with a, a phantom monk. These kinds of extraordinary experience are a regular occurrence. Indeed, there have been so many strange happenings at Shingle Hall that it has become a focus of a great deal of paranormal research to try to pin down something of what is going on here. The method of investigation that we've used here mainly is experience rather than scientific methods. Um, people that come here with me, investigators or skeptics and believers alike from different um, 
different jobs, different types of people, different ages. And they all come here looking for something that hopefully they're going to see. Um, but that doesn't happen here very often. More often you have other kinds of experiences, things which can be scientifically recorded. And the simple equipment that we have used here involves tape recorders, video observations, single lens reflex cameras. And with all those different kinds of equipment, we have come up with evidence here. We've had photographs of ghosts taken, not seen at the time, but when later on films have been developed of photographs taken here, um, at the time of exposure, something has obviously been around because something has been appeared on the film afterwards, some kind of image. These are some of the strange photographs that have been taken. This one, for example, seems to show a swirl or a spiral of energy with a slightly mannequin shape. Many of them show vague misty outlines in various parts of the rooms or on the stairs. They're similar to other photographs taken in houses where paranormal activity is frequent. The key point is they all come from ordinary visitors' snaps. No one was aware of anything when the snaps were taken. The images were revealed only in the printing. But of course it's difficult to verify that these are anything other than fogging or perhaps some more elaborate deception. The same is true of the recordings taken during sittings. This one, for example, claims to record the sound of an eerie and guttural scream. It was analysed and defined as not coming from a human throat. But again, these are scarcely acceptable as evidence of anything. Indeed, that is one of the commonest scientific responses to much of what goes on at Shingle Hall, part hoax, part hokum. We do not know, unfortunately, the nature and the context of the experience that took place. And because the experiences are anecdotal, it would be dangerous to interpret anything much else from that. If we have strict scientific conditions there, if we do a series or a long-term investigation there, when such things do go on, when we can eliminate such things with perhaps sealed doors, where they are more structurally sealed but can still be broken by, by a force similar to that, just a human walking into a room or something, and they are again, in thoroughly controlled conditions, opened, manipulated, the sounds have then occurred, we can measure them, monitor them, experience them even, and then make a, a far better informed judgment from. It's very dangerous dealing with the anecdotal. But the paranormal is by definition anecdotal. The fact that scientists can't get a grip on what is happening here, can't measure it or correlate it, let alone repeat it in any meaningful way, that simply describes the problems that science has in dealing with the paranormal. It certainly doesn't prove that these happenings aren't happening. And I was in the chapel here with a party from New Zealand and one girl suddenly turned around and she said, oh, look at the white habited figure against the wall. And we turned and there was a monk standing by the wall there. Very, very clear. You couldn't see his features. He had his hand like this up against his face as if he, as if he was guarding his features. And he was there for about a four minute and then he gradually faded. And my other sighting was up in the John Wall room upstairs. And as you probably know, people in those days were much smaller. Than when the men were five feet and under, and the women even smaller. And he was standing beside the door, which is a very small door. And he was standing beside it. You could see, again, the cowled head, the folded arms, and the, the robes. And he was there for a full minute, and then he gradually faded away. He was very, very clear. And I sat next to the window. Somebody was sat next to me. We had the lights off. And uh, everyone was being really quiet. We were trying to be quiet, trying to listen. And I heard the sound, and I, and I just thought it was my heart at first, because my heart was beating so fast. And it was unmistakable, I don't know, Latin chanting, and the feeling of oppression in the room was just unbelievable. It, I just felt, I had put my jumper over my head, actually. Even though I couldn't see anything anyway, I was just really frightened, and I, I asked half, somebody to come out with me, because it was just a really bad feeling in there, as if something as if you just captured a minute of something that had happened in there and you just got a taste of it and it's something more unnerving than you could ever imagine. I was coming here to do some uh, filming about some research that was going on in Chingle Hall so we thought it'd be a good idea to stay the night and basically what turned out what we thought would be a fun evening just turned into a complete nightmare I mean I will never this is the closest you'll get me inside Chingle Hall because I will not go through the door it just it scared me rigid. A great deal of time has been spent at Shingle Hall trying to identify just who some of the most frequently seen apparitions might be. Although there have been many sightings of monk-like figures, as it happens, some of the most prominent stories are linked to two women. One of them is Margaret Howarth. She owned Shingle Hall in the 50s and led a very social life here. The legend has it that she loved Shingle Hall so much she's never been able to tear herself away, despite her death. There are many extraordinary stories told about the Grey Lady, as she's called. And a young couple came up one evening, they'd heard about Chingle Hall, and they thought, oh, we'd like to have a look round here. So they came up, 
didn't know if anybody would be there or if it would be empty. And he knocked on the sanctuary knocker, and this little old lady answered the door. And they said, oh, we'd like to have a look around Jingle Hall. Is it possible for you to show us around? And she said, oh, certainly, come in. She showed them all around the hall, and they were fascinated, and told, she told them all the stories of all these things that happened to her. And eventually they said goodbye, and off they went. And they said, she said, oh, my name's Mrs. Howarth. And they went down to the pub. They went in, and they were talking to the locals, and they said, oh, we've just been up to Jingle Hall, and Mrs. Howarth has showed us around, and we're fascinated with it. And they said, Mrs. Howarth died 12 months ago. Eleanor de Singleton's story is quite different. She dates from the 16th century, and she is the centre of a quite horrific story in which it's difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. She was allegedly imprisoned and abused from a young age by her uncles in one of the rooms upstairs. Eleanor de Singleton was um, the last person from the de Singleton line to have the hall, and she was about six when her parents died. And she was then looked after by two uncles. She was kept in one room, which is the priest room here at Chingle Hall. Um, it's very hard to talk about and people perhaps think it's a bit bizarre, but she was a victim of sexual abuse from six to 18 by her two uncles. And she had quite a lot of stillborn children and she had four birthed children that actually breathed. Each one of these children were actually murdered and burned. And um, the last one was a hydrocephalic child with a, an enormous head that she died giving birth to. And a lot of the emotional trauma that she experienced in the room has somehow been locked in the atmosphere and at times is replayed to people who walk into the room, uh, especially women who often break down in floods of tears here or they have fits, they feel faint or dizzy and certainly lots of people have had a, um, a horrible experience in the room and have to be taken out, not able to explain the feeling uh, that they've, that's overcome them. No particular reason for it, just an overcome feeling of dread, horror, desolation, fear and they've had to be taken out of the room and out of the hall. Even given its long and troubled history, the range and complexity of the happenings at Shingle Hall is still quite remarkable. Several investigators put this down, in part at least, to its location. It lies, they say, at the crossing point of several magnetic fault lines. Now, Shingle Hall is built on crossed lay lines. The word lay is spelt L-E-Y, chore lay, burn lay, lay land. And if anything is built on lay lines, it's prone to electrical, magnetic, paranormal forces. Far to the south of Shingle Hall, near Glastonbury in Somerset, this is one of this country's most renowned experts on ley lines and their effects, Dr. Roni Dougal. I have come across places where you get ley lines crossing or several ley lines converging, and they are places where you get psychic effects happening, where you get people seeing ghosts, where you get time slips, people um, seeing things that have happened at another time or experiencing things from another time. And it's part of the modern idea about ley lines, that a ley line crossing is a place of particular energy. Now an awful lot of the old churches, an awful lot of old houses were actually built at these places because the people who built in those days, we're going back now four, five, six hundred years, were actually much more in tune with the environment than we are now. Um, they were people who lived outside much more, they walked more, they were out there on their horses, and they were very aware of what places felt like. Shingle Hall, I understand, is on the intersection of two underground geological fault lines, producing strong seismic activity and, and uh, possibly microwave radiation. These can very easily give rise to uh, phenomena in the brain that would cause anything from visual and auditory hallucinations to senses of fear or elation, or tingling, definite body reactions, all of which people would interpret as something paranormal, whereas in fact they can be actually reproduced by beaming certain frequencies at uh, people in those situations. In fact, this has been developed uh, in a more uh, macabre way by the US military, who are using certain frequencies for crowd control and for definite military situations. If you hypothesize that the, the truly paranormal is some frequencies that we are not normally sensitive to in the huge range of the electromagnetic spectrum that is out there, then yes, it is quite possible, particularly if you're electrically shocked, as it seems to be the case, that areas that you otherwise normally are blocked out from you, uh, you could suddenly become very sensitive to and react paranormally. Others would argue there is a far more straightforward explanation, namely that people get from Shingle Hall exactly what they expect to get, a bit of a thrill. Many people indeed are prepared to pay for the excitement of spending a night here. And the argument goes, they come to the place filled with paranormal expectations. You'll be looking for, for two things not to be there. Prior knowledge and expectation. 
Unfortunately, every experience at Jingle Hall has prior knowledge of the building being haunted and the expectation of what's around every corner. These to a very, very high level. And those with, added with the other ingredients, um, again, gives me um, reason for concern. But can that be a complete answer to the extraordinary range of events that have been experienced here by people from all walks of life with totally different personalities and characters and expectations? We spoke, for example, to a group of ordinary people who had spent the night at Shingle Hall. They had no doubt whatsoever about the disturbing nature of their experiences. Going up towards three o'clock in the morning, Jason said, like, if you want, we'll have a seance. And I'm thinking to myself, I thought, oh, right, yeah, <laughs> I've heard about this sort of thing. And uh, I wasn't feeling any, any strangeness or anything. And uh, whatever it was seemed to become me straight away. <laughs> um, I felt a cold shiver down my back. And then no sooner it warmed up and there was a feeling of a tremendous pressure on my back. It was like, um, like somebody had two hands on my back and they were pushing really hard and I was holding myself against it. A really incredible force of pressure. But it didn't just stop on my back, it actually came through my body. With a, you know, the force was unbelievable. And when it actually came out of the front of my body, it relieved me. And I was actually I were absolutely gasping for breath. And no sooner had it left me, my wife Wendy was sat on my left, and another girl, Angela, that was sat on my right. They both experienced the same thing. And at one stage, I had floods of tears rolling down my face. I wasn't uh, feeling any depression or sadness or anything. Uh, it was just an overwhelming experience of tears. And it was quite late, and uh, I heard this clanging, crashing noise in the porch. Um, I wanted to go investigate it, so I opened the door and uh, to my amazement what I saw was this chair um, physically moving on its own and making a hell of a noise because obviously it's a tile floor here and the chair was doing this uh, violent movements um, and obviously I witnessed this and I was on my own I wanted to go and get someone else to see it so I shouted to my friend Andy who came and the rest of them didn't want to come see it um, and he, he saw it, I turned the light on because we wanted to see this happen and it was very very cold in here um, and turn the light on and the chair was still moving. Now obviously this sort of, it felt like a long time, but in actual time it was probably about 30 seconds. We were inside the hall with, uh, with eight nurses who were, here, who were here on a sponsored sit-in and it all started out as, as good fun and everybody was, was jovial and joking. And it, and it just, it, it turned very nasty. We were all upstairs, the first experience was about an hour after I'd arrived. And we were all upstairs sitting down in one of the, in one of the rooms. And one of the nurses who were, who were cynics at the rest of the time just turned and said, I can see something, there's somebody above your shoulder to one of the nurses in the corner. And the way she said it, we just knew it, it wasn't, she wasn't joking. And the nurse on the other side said, oh God, I can feel him, I can feel him, but I can't look, I'm too scared to look. And, and there were a couple of others that actually saw this figure in a hood standing above, above the nurses, and that was it. I mean, that was the first episode, and it completely freaked her. I mean, she was in tears, she couldn't talk for about an hour and a half, and it was, we knew then that it was going to be a very, a very, very long night. It was the first occasion we came, we were all sat around the fire, and we were just talking, having a, having a drink, and the, the girl who was actually sat with her back against the wall just leaned forward suddenly. She went absolutely white, the blood just went out of her face, and we were sort of leaning forward, are you okay? And this, a, a psychic breeze was moving around the, cr the crowd. It's as if it had come through the wall, had sensed we were there, which was looking back on it, it was quite unusual. It didn't walk straight through us all. It walked around us all, as if it was aware that we, we were there. And then there was a, a, a heavy knock on the door. It's, it's just not similar, it's just nothing like when, when you knock the door, the sound's not like that. It's as though there's more in resonance and it, and it, tends, it sounds like it's going throughout the whole house and through everything through you. It's really a really bizarre sort of thing. It's, not, it's as if it's not a human that's doing it. There is no doubt that Shingle Hall has become immensely commercialised. As the most haunted house in England, it's become a nice little earner. Groups of people pay handsomely to spend a night here to experience that tingle up the spine. But one has to ask, does that make Shingle Hall any less haunted? She had a dog show on the car park and several people came up that day and said, where's the monastery? Because when we've been here, we'd like to go and visit the monastery. And she said, there's no monastery around here. And they said, well, how do you explain the monks that have been walking across the drawbridge, across the car park, and disappearing into the distance. 